So I wanted to make a little video about this instrument I just received. It's a slightly oddball one, but it is very, very important from all kinds of particle detection systems and uh, nuclear spectroscopy setups and uh, anything in that kind of sort of world. Uh, and it is a pulse generator. Now this is the Tenelec TC812 pulser and uh, it is 1968 vintage and supposedly it is surplus from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The main problem that this aims to solve is that the pulses generated by any kind of nuclear detector, any kind of particle detector, be it a Cherenkov detector, a Geiger counter, or a photomultiplier on a scintillation counter, or silicon surface barrier detector, it doesn't matter. They all give a pulse that's roughly has the same physical appearance, which is a very fast rise time and an exponential decay. Now, the problem of gener generating this pulse is that, uh, well, basically, if whatever instrument you have needs to have the bandwidth of so the very narrow rise time, right? Like uh, most arbitrary pulse generators and uh, most common, you know, laboratory pulse generators won't be able to make this pulse shape just because it's, well, it's not in very common use. And either way, it's very common to have these separate modules just for this. And uh, the way you make these pulses is uh, deceivingly simple and very, very brilliantly designed. So uh, let's go over it very quickly. So basically what we have is we have a knob, a vernier knob here, ten turn pot, a relay on off, a calibration that's just in series with the pot, it's just another resistor in series with this pot, a polarity switch, and an output. That's basically what this is. The only other things here are this attenuator section here, which can be used as a separate attenuator or be an attenuated output for this. And that's it. You can change the polarity and you can change the pulse height. You cannot, and you can turn the the pulser on and off. That is a very very important feature, by the way. Um, I will, you will, you'll see, you'll see. Either way, you can change the the frequency of the pulse, and it is uh, in in my country it's fifty hertz because it just uses the frequency of the mains. It's actually very very brilliantly done. Let me show you. So this is what it looks like on the inside. It has exactly four transistors and a tiny PCB and a giant room for nothing. There's not much to these, but they have one vital component that I had never ever encountered before and probably won't again. It's this. And this is a mercury wetted relay. Now this is not a mercury tilt switch, which many of you may know where you have like a little vial of mercury and then it can, you know, make or break contacts. The mercury wetted relay is a very very fast relay invented i think in the 40s and mainly for scientific applications and like very very specific applications because what it does it, it allows you to have a fast pulse without any ringing you don't see any very very little ringing on the, the relay output at least so i've not been able to find a schematic for this but i traced out a little of the circuit and it is really as simple as it seems we have the relay which, like all relays, are driven by a coil. And this coil is just connected to the mains. 110 volts. Now this side of the relay are connected to the two large capacitors here. One pin here, the normally closed pin on the relay, goes to the potentiometer on the front, and the other goes to the output. There's literally no more to this than this, except that there's a few transistor buffers around. I'm not exactly sure where they sit, but uh, and then of course there's the front panel logic and the uh, the switches and stuff like that. But but this is basically what happens. The uh, the mercury relay is just continuously flicked on and off by the AC voltage, and it is an unfiltered AC from the NIM bin. Thus, it just changes between charging and discharging these capacitors, and the voltage they charge to is set by this potentiometer. And that's about what's in there. And the reason this works is because this mercury wetted relay is able to switch so quickly and so cleanly. I, I think if you replaced it with a normal relay, you would see something very terrible. 
but uh, it might be interesting to try actually. A useful feature for this uh, for, to calibrate your, your system is also that uh, it has provisions to for an external voltage and an external relay driver. So you can set your own like like a random gate generator to give a random pulse count each minute and give it a random voltage for like a true simulation. But, right, but it might be interesting to see it actually in operation. So one second. Right, so here we are. This is a very minimal NIMBIN. It just has a spectroscopy amplifier and the pulsar. Then I have a preamp here, which is the preamp I would normally use with my scintillation counter. Seen here. I've made a test input on this. I've built this myself. And uh, the test input is just uh, feeds, feeds into the same amplifier, but through a very, very small capacitor. And that works quite well. So let's hook it up. So we just take the direct output here. And we feed it to the test input here. So the signal path is pulse generator, preamplifier. The preamplifier is getting power from the bin. Preamplifier out, directly into the input of the spectroscopy amplifier. Output of the spectroscopy amplifier, going to scope and going to a PC card down here, which is running on a multi-channel analyzer. Right, so first of all, let's take a look at the output from the actual pulse generator. Normally, if it, this was a detector, you would have to use the preamplifier and buffer it, but uh, since this is a pretty low impedance signal, we can actually just connect a cable like that directly to our scope. And let's just turn the brilliant down so we can actually see it. Turn on the NIMBIN and turn on the relay. And now you will come to learn why it is nice that you can turn it off. It sounds very loud. You can hear the relay click. And look, pulses, nice clean pulses. This is exactly what I was talking about. Notice how the rising edge, or the falling edge in this case, of the pulses are actually too fast to be seen on my scope. This is just a normal little 20 megahertz scope. Um, we can switch the polarity. That works fine. We can switch the time base. I think you can, I'm not sure how that works, but I assume it kind of either uses one or two of the capacitors in parallel. It works fairly well, and we can trigger on if we want to. Now I use the negative mode mostly because uh, that's what my detector would do. It kind of depends on how your detector is biased, but if your detector is positively biased, it'll usually give a negative peak out. Let's turn off the relay. Put in the preamplifier. We can assume that the preamplifier output looks exactly the same. Um, I will do a more in-depth video on nuclear preamplifiers at some point, um, because it is a hassle beyond belief. Either way, now it goes into the spectroscopy amplifier. This is a shaping amplifier that should convert the pulse to a Gaussian pulse. It's the unipolar output here. It's not terminated. You don't really need that with these short cables. And uh, 2 microseconds shaping time, 200 times gain, times 1.4, and uh, we have some pulse zero adjustment in, and uh, we have the amplifier set to negative mode, and uh, no delay. So, let's switch it on and see. And would you look at that? Let's see if we can trigger on that. That is exactly what you want a nuclear pulse to look like. Almost symmetrical, with no undershoot. Let's vary the pulse height. We are at 1 volt per division, by the way. This is a very working instrument. And the only thing I did on this instrument when I got it was change an electrolytic capacitor that had leaked. Uh, else the instrument just worked fine. And now let's try to add in the multi-channel analyzer and let's actually see if this if this analyzer isn't drifting, it should just give a single peak. This is the cable to the multi-channel analyzer. This is the multi-channel analyzer and we can just do an acquire. And look at that. Look at that. This is exactly what you're supposed to see. 
Now there's a little drift and you'll see that because all of this NIM electronics it needs to warm up. Really you should have left it on half an hour before you want to use it. This is exactly how you tune all of this electronics. If you have an undershoot, like so a pulse that was kind of bipolar that would have a, a negative segment before returning to the baseline. This is called undershoot and uh, it's undesirable of course because what will happen is if the next pulse lands on that tail then the next pulse will be will look lower to the electronics that it actually is so that'll give peak broadening um, and you can compensate for that but with a, a pulse zero adjustment circuit and I have both one in this spectroscopy preamplifier and I'll, I've also built one in here uh, I'm using both of them to, to make this peak nice and um, once again I'll do a comprehensive video on that at some point but it is uh, it took some time figuring out but either way that's uh, that's how a nuclear pulser works Fairly few people will ever need this instrument, but uh, those who do cannot live without it. So yeah, I hope you found that interesting. Um, I just thought I would share my little acquisition of this module with uh, with a nice pedigree and uh, a very, very valuable use. Thanks for watching.